All right, guys, we'll get uh, started here. Can you hear me okay? Cool. So we're actually about to present uh, our entire architecture. This is kind of uh, how we built the real-time user segmentation on EdgeBase. Um, the entire use case we are going to present is completely built on open source technologies and, of course, heavily leverages EdgeBase. So, uh, Rich Relevance, um, I'll probably give a brief introduction, but we are a startup in the city and we do personalization. And uh, Yang and I both are from the engineering team at Rich Relevance. So, the outline of the talk is going to be very quickly, we're going to talk about what Rich Relevance does. I'll, I won't spend a whole lot of time on that, maybe just a couple of minutes. We'll jump into what the problem statement is around user segmentation. We'll talk about the, how we build this, the entire design architecture end to end on right from data ingestion, how we do the compute and how the models are delivered. And then we'll talk about some performance metrics around EdgeBase and uh, how we solve some of the performance problems we encountered on EdgeBase. So Rich Relevance is a dynamic personalization company for commerce. So pretty much, you know, we, we have solutions uh, are dominantly around retailers and brands. And this is just an example on what we have built so far. We have a personalization engine, which is called Enrich. And on top of Enrich, what we have is that we have three different products which we have built. One, all the three products are software as a service products. They range from the recommendation product, which is Rich Rex. So if you go to a retailer site, uh, the usual suspects like Walmart, Target, Sears, um, Rich Relevance is actually delivering the recommendations on that site. So if you visit a product page, if you see a set of recommendations, that's what we do. In addition to that, we also have a promotion product, which is basically delivering targeted promotions for retailers. And the third one is advertising. So if you visit target.com, if you see an ad, that's also served by Rich Elements. So basically, all kinds of content personalization is what we are into. <clears throat> so this is the glimpse of our cloud platform, what we have built so far. And uh, basically, it, it talks about a few different things, right? One is a single place where you can have all your data on one single platform. It also talks about direct access to your data. So most of the enterprise companies we talk to, the data is actually distributed across a lot of different systems, a lot of different disparate systems, right from their CRM system, it could be you know, managed on their ERP system and uh, other systems where they're manage, managing their online data. So the whole idea is to provide a single platform to store all of their data and to access their data through APIs. Uh, real time is a big piece of our platform. So, and that's what, what the use case is all, all about as well. How do you convert events which are generated in real time to actionable insights is what the platform does. And then of course, linking all the user activity across different channels, as well as learning from information which we get from social sites like Twitter, Facebook, uh, and Pin Interest. And the, the basic idea behind all of this is to provide a single view of the customer across channels. So if you're buying online uh, and shopping online, and if you walk into a store, if the store person can identify you as a customer, then they can personalize your in-store experience. And vice versa, if you're buying online and we have your in-store history or any other history which we grab across different channels, we can then personalize that information as well. And all the use cases which you see on the far right are basically all the use cases we are, have built on the platform. And the one which you want to talk about today is around real-time segmentation. And that's, that's kind of the crux of what we're going to talk about. So this is a slide which actually highlights some of the tidbit information on our platform. Uh, of course, if you're from Facebook, Yahoo, or Google, or Microsoft, the numbers are not going to be kind of, it's going to be insignif insignificant for you all. But a startup of our size, the numbers are pretty significant. Uh, so in terms of technologies, we leverage all of these usual suspect technologies, Hive, EdgeBase, Avro, Azkaban, uh, on our platform, on our big data platform. And in terms of the scale and the volume, uh, we're talking about 7,000 requests per second on an average, and the response time is very critical for us. So we have to serve recommendations or any kind of content under 50 milliseconds. Uh, in terms of our Hadoop cluster, it's 1.5 petabytes of Hadoop cluster and uh, we have about 100 plus algorithms which are deployed on this, um, on, on the platform. And uh, mm -hmm. another piece of information is that you know, every, one, every 21 milliseconds, someone actually clicks on a recommendation which is served by Rich Relevance. 
So let's talk about the real-time user segmentation use case, uh, and you know we'll get into depths of what that what we do with that. So you know this slide highlights that you know Amanda and Jessica are two different shoppers mm -hmm. out there, and they both have different interests, and they both are probably also belonging to different segments, as you can see. So Amanda is you know into all kinds of sports activities, and Jessica loves fashion and lives in LA. So if you if you think about these two users and shoppers. The, the next thing, if we understand, understand the behavior of Amanda and Jessica, what we could do for them based on their interest and based on what segment they belong, is we can totally personalize their experience. So Amanda might get uh, you know, a letter in mail which says, I have a new collection in store for you. And Jessica has a completely different experience. She gets a 50% off coupon, whether it's online or in some way we deliver that coupon. So, one important or key aspect we wanted to highlight is that the events we collect from, uh, from a retailer site, all the clickstream data and any other offline data which we collect, we can use all of that information to personalize the experience for the end user. So think about this. Think about going from events which we collect online or real time from anywhere, from all these different channels. Think about going from events to insights which we develop after collecting these events, and then from insights going all the way to actions. So the action in this case is basically Amanda getting that in-store, uh, getting the, you know, the newsletter or the thing in the mail, and Jessica getting the coupon. And that's the action which we generated on the platform. Um, and the, I mean, the way we collect this information, just to guys give you guys in, um, you know, a little bit more information on how Rich Relevance is instrumented, we are instrumented on the retailer's website. So we have a little JavaScript uh, script running on the thing which collects every single interaction which you have with the website. So if you go to Walmart, Target, Sears, behind the scenes we are collecting all this clickstream information to say, hey, what did you view, what you clicked, what you purchased? And then we use that, all that information. And it's not only just online information, right? A lot of these retailers provide us with their in-store sales. So whatever you're getting, you're buying in-store, we are also, or if you're buying through a kiosk or a mobile device, we get all of that information as well. So combination of online and offline, and then we combine all of that to do the user segmentation piece of it. So what is the segment builder which we have built? Uh, I just want to talk about a little bit about you know, how we have built this segmentation, and then we'll talk about the edge-based piece of it, which is, I'm sure is more interesting for you guys. But just to quickly talk about what the use case is. So in terms of the attributes of the segment, right? It's the important piece of the attribute are DMA and any kind of demographic information. And in any attribute is pretty much game for a segment. So we figure out what these qualified attributes are, and then we segment these users into these buckets. And you know, the, the, like I said earlier, the pieces of information which we use to actually create the segment is the clickstream data. So it's views, clicks, and purchases, and any kind of information which we collect when you're interacting with the site. So if you're clicking on, on a product, you're clicking on a brand, and we get that information. If we see that you have an affinity towards a certain brand or you have an affinity towards a certain category, then that's, that makes you that part of that segment as well. So that's the segment builder we have built, and there is a component of UI which we have built, which I'll, there are a couple of uh, slides around there. So this is just a typical list of segments for a particular user. And you know, this is also illustrates how we actually build the segment. So if you're familiar with Google Analytics and or Omniture or any of these platforms, there is a way to create a segment on it. So you take your different attributes, you figure out the values, and then you put all those fields or attributes together. So you could say that, you know, um, I want to create a new mom segment. So all females, uh, all women in California under a certain, uh, in a particular age group who are looking for baby products. And that's your new mom segment. So you can create all of these segments on the platform, and then you can evaluate these segments in real time. But the, the thing which differentiates us from most of the segment providers is the fact that we are real time, and that's what the use case is all about. So this slide talks about our evaluation engine, right? I mean, what do we do? We, we create these uh, segments through the UI. Every behavior is captured through a rule, and that's what the concept uh, on the segmentation is. And then what we do is that based on the different rules which are part of this segment, when you evaluate it, which figure out which users belong to this segment. And then based on that, we personalize the information for that user. So if we figure out that someone is interested or belongs to a certain segment, we can trigger an action. And the action is completely configurable. You can say that I want to send an email campaign out based on this segment uh, or this user coming into the segment, or you want to send an uh, in-store coupon, or you want to send something information online, however you want to personalize the experience for the user. 
Um, so one other piece of this is, which I want to highlight on the platform, now since we talked about the use case, the next piece of information is that, how do we get the data into the platform? How do we collect these events in real time? And that's where I want to describe the architecture around how we utilized Avro and Kafka. And once we talk about that, the real-time data ingestion piece, then we'll talk about how the evaluation piece of that works. So the real-time data ingestion is actually a critical piece of the platform. Because what happens is that when you're interacting online or in store, those events which happen in real time, we can't afford to do any kind of ETL or ELT on that. The events have to be ingested in real time for us, which means that if you're in store and if you scan an item, I have to get that event in real time and we have to react to that event in real time as well. And that's where the whole story from event to insights to action goes. So what we do when an event is actually triggered is that behind the scenes we create an Avro record which depicts, which has its own schema and you can register any event on the platform. And then we use our Apache Kafka framework which we have built, which I'll, I'll show the architecture around there, where how we take the Avro record and how do you ingest that Avro record onto using Kafka and we put that Avro record into our edge-based cluster. <clears throat> so I wanna highlight some of the design principles we use for the real time. So if you're going on and building your own real-time data ingestion solution, um, I mean, I'm sure you run, run into some of these concepts as well. So one big piece uh, which is kind of I wanna highlight is the fact around streaming, right? Most of the systems, like I said, do ETL and ELT, but we wanna actually stream the data. We wanna stream the events and we wanna collect the events using streaming technologies. The reliability is very, very key. And you can imagine, right, that when you're capturing a site interaction, that what leads to a purchase on the retailer's site, you can't afford to lose an event. So if you're, if you're about to make a purchase, and if you view 10 different products before making that purchase, I have to reliably get all those 10 events. And the other piece of it is also the ordering, which means that I have to get those 10 events in, a, in that specific order. Uh, scalability, of course, it's a no-brainer. I mean, we have to scale. So as and when we add more sites on the platform, we have to scale um, based on that as well. The other piece is distributed system, so we don't, I mean, we don't want a single point of failure as well, but it has to be distributed. So this is, you know, that's one of the key concepts as well. And the persistence of messages, right? So as we're collecting this information, we are persisting the messages behind the scenes. It's not a volatile thing whether we, or a transient thing where you get an event and we lose the event. We have to collect the event and we have to store the history for that. Uh, the other piece I do want to highlight is uh, the push-pull mechanism. So the most of the technologies on the data ingestion side are all the way push. Uh, so if you look at things like Flume, where you're collecting the events, you know, you're pushing the event from the real time or the runtime system or your web server, it goes all the way to Hadoop uh, or any other end sync which you want to store that event. So push-pull mechanism is very different. The producer is actually producing the events and then the consumers can actually pull those events at their own rates which means you're producing millions of, or billions of events per second, but the consumer can decide at what rate they want to consume these events. If I, don't, if, if I want to run my consumer every hour, or every second, or every day, I need to have the functionality, I need to have the design uh, basically accommodate that particular use case as well. So that's a very important aspect around push-pull mechanism. The other piece is compression, of course, you know, since we are storing billions of events every day, we have to store the data in a compressed format and uh, we have to keep our operation guys happy, so the operational complexity and the ability to monitor the system has to be built in. So like I said, our decision, we went with Apache Kafka, and uh, it, was, it wasn't an easy decision. We actually evaluated quite a few different systems. We looked at Flume, we looked at RabbitMQ, we looked at ActiveMQ, we kind of thought also about a homegrown system around this, but ultimately we went with Kafka for these specific reasons. So it's distributed, you know, it follows the PubSub model, works perfectly for us, fits our use case, fits all the principles, it's very generic, and you know, of course, we wanna support our offline use cases as well as the online use cases. And ordering, like I said, is really important for us. So if you're collecting all these site events, the, the order in which the events are collected is what the order in the events we need to be persistent because when we do a real time series or a time series graph of all these events, we need to capture that information. The other uh, piece of information which I, you know, from a Kafka perspective is the capability to do a rewind and an offset, um, you know, rewind the offset and do offset management. So let's assume that you're consuming all your data and um, you know, you've just consumed the last hour worth of data and you realize that, wait a minute, you know, somehow your data got corrupted. 
So you want to rewind your offset and say, I want to go back like the entire day and I want to start you know, replaying all my events. So you need the ability to actually rewind and replay all your events. And that's really, really important, especially in the case when you're actually losing data or also in the case when you want to simulate something. Um, the other piece which Kafka offers us is the fact that there is no concept of a master node. So, you know, brokers are peers, which is a really, so single point of failure, we definitely want to avoid that. So this kind of highlights what our architecture looks like uh, and how we actually built it. So the other piece of it is that we are very, very distributed. We have 10 data centers across the globe. And the whole idea is that how do you take data across all these different data centers and how do you push that all of that data into edge base? So if you look at this picture, the, the key piece is that the two colos or data centers are basically our runtime colos. That's where all our web servers are. And the web servers are also completely stateless. All the models are actually stored uh, on the runtime machine itself. And then we also have a concept of a key value store where you can store off-box models, which are not on the runtime. So most of the models we store are actually in memory. And then the, the runtime or the web server is actually our Kafka producer. The Kafka brokers which you see on the runtime is basically a concept on Kafka where the events are actually temporarily stored. And then on the backend side, you see a little box on the bottom. That's our backend infrastructure. That's where we have a mirrored setup of <coughs> Kafka brokers. So all of these events which are collected from all these different data centers, 10 across the globe, we, all of those events are mirrored on these brokers. And then we have this series of different consumers. We have, we have the edge-based consumer, which, you know, that's kind of the use case we want to present today. We have an HDFS consumer, which can stream those events on HDFS. Uh, and even on the HDFS side, we have two different consumers. We have one consumer, which is a sync consumer, which keeps actually a file open on edge, edge base and streams everything and syncs up the data on HDFS. And then we also have an offline HDFS consumer. There is a database consumer, you know, of course, we want to some of the events we want to aggregate and store in a database, so we put that in Postgres. And then we, of course, have an operational and open TSDB consumer so that we can do some graphing and analysis on how the streams and everything is performing. So that's kind of the one I'll highlight on the consumer side of things, that it's not just one consumer. We have a series of different consumers. And this is where the producer, broker, and consumer concept comes in. This is where the push-pull concept comes in. The other part which I want to highlight is the fact that um, we took Apache Kafka and we actually built a consumer framework around it. So as you can imagine, I just mentioned that we have like six or seven different consumers. It's very important for us to have one consumer framework for it. So tomorrow if you plug in another consumer in our system, I mean, we have to deal with schema management because we're talking about Avro here. So there is a, we are also working on an Avro schema repository, which we plan to give it back to Avro pretty soon. We are active Avro committers at Rich Relevance. The how to do Z, zookeeper management, there is aspects around zookeeper which is very tricky and you don't want to do that management across all the different consumers. You know, that's where the common framework comes in. The metrics and the monitoring piece of it. So when you have a new consumer, we use our consumer framework and we just plug that consumer in and everything else is taken care of. The part around offset management, the part around the schema repository, monitoring metrics, you know, it all, all seamlessly works. Does not really matter where the data goes in HDFS, it goes to edge base or database, the concept or the consumer framework is the same. So some of the volume facts I want to highlight is, you know, in terms of daily clickstream data which we collect, we collect about 150 gigs of clickstream data. This is just the clickstream data which we collect. The average size of the message is about two kilobytes. This is the Avro message. Uh, and the batch size for us is 5,000 uh, messages. The producer throughput, which we are currently have, is 5,000 messages per second. And the consumer, the real-time edge-based consumer, can support a throughput of 7,000 messages per second. So we have actually tuned that, and uh, Yang will talk more about how the edge-based <coughs> consumer has been tuned as well. <coughs> So the end-to-end real-time story, right? What, what is the entire segmentation story? User exhibits a behavior mm -hmm. online or in store or any other channel. The events are actually generated on our front-end data center, so the runtime machines, which I just uh, highlighted in the architecture picture. The events are streamed using Kafka, infra, the Apache Kafka infrastructure, onto our back-end data center. And then we index the events in edge base. And from there, that's where the event, index evaluation or the segment evaluation engine runs on the data stored in edge base. And that's where we create the segment and evaluate which users are actually fit the segment. So if you look at it pictorially, 
basically this is where the shopper comes in, you know, interacts with the site, the clickstream events are produced the, on the runtime machine or on the web server. We have the Kafka broker. So the topmost portion is basically our, the, the runtime infrastructure or the front end colo. And on the back end side, that's where we have the mirrored Kafka brokers and we have the HBS consumer. So um, I'll stop here, I'll, I'll let Yang pick the rest of the conversation. Uh, the idea is to walk you guys through the entire design on Edgebase, how we build the schema, uh, how we you know, constructed the index around it, and how the actual segmentation evaluation works. Okay, thanks. <coughs> So let's compare uh, rich relevance uh, segmentation engines versus the other ones out there. There's one important, very important and significant uh, distinction that I like to emphasize, which is at rich relevance, we do everything in real time. That's very important. So if you look at this user story here, the shopper is exhibiting behaviors at all of our um, regional data center. And the behaviors are streamed and collected in, and indexed in HBase within a few seconds. It's very, and why is real time important? Real time is important because we need to engage the user um, as soon as possible while the user's interest level is still high and relevant. Most of the um, engines out there will not give you the users in a segment um, in real time. And there's a lag that is between hours or even days. Um, for example, if you have a user who is looking at or clicking on Ferrari ads and looking at Ferrari pages you know, 20 times in the last hours, and uh, you know, he just turned 40, um, and you know, he, he makes a lot of money, and you know, you want to engage that user ASAP. You can't afford to wait, you know, two days. You know, his interest level is going to be somewhere else. So real time is very important. Um, and the technologies that we use to do this are o o open source and scalable um, versus the other ones out there, which are usually proprietary and um, very, very hard to scale. So there are two use cases uh, for user segmentation. The first one is when the user exhibit behaviors, we ingest that data, index that data in real time, and put that users into, the, the user into segments. And then um, the segment can be calculated and the users can be retrieved you know, in seconds. That's use case number one, and that's very hard to do. Um, the other use case is we take the behavior and calculate the segment membership for that user so we know when the user moves in and out of segments and then we can create a notification for, for that event. Use case number two, um, it's quite easy to do. So why do we use HBase? It makes all of this possible, obviously. Um, and you know, HBase is optimized for read and scan, which is very important when we have to answer queries like you know, a very complex query to get other users for the segment. We have to be able to read and scan very quickly. And HBase uh, cell versioning supports our frequency use case. So what is frequency? Um, frequency is the amount of time that the user exhibited a behavior. Um, so we can answer questions like, I want our users who um, you know, perform this action, you know, click on a product or do something you know, exactly 10 times in the last two days. We can answer questions like that. And uh, the cell versioning in HBase supports that use case really well. We also looked at um, a couple of other technologies um, like Cassandra, but uh, you know, the eventual consistency model in Cassandra doesn't support our use case because when a user exhibits a chain of behavior, we have to be able to capture that chain of event. For example, they looked at something, click on something that led to a purchase. We have to get that exact sequence. Um, with eventual consistency, that does not work very well. 
The other technology that we looked at is uh, for indexing is, um, I forgot the, were you guys at the LinkedIn? Anybody at the LinkedIn the presentation yesterday? It's just right off the tongue, tip of my tongue. Um, um, Lucene, that's right. So Lucene was another piece of technology that we looked at. Um, Lucene is very good for uh, looking up the index to calculate the count, user count, and things like that. But for real-time um, index update uh, and document retrieval, it's actually does not work very well. So we did not use Lucene. And HBase integrates seamlessly with Hadoop. Um, and the key with HBase is that with good row key design, you can um, achieve very good read and write performance. And I'll go into the details here. So let's look at um, how we designed the row key. Um, we took several attempts to get it right. Um, and some of the design considerations that we uh, took, in, took into account was um, you know, whether we need to put the timestamp into the row key or the columns, um, whether we should parti uh, partition the behavior by date, um, do we optimize for read or write. Um, in the case of Lucene, you can optimize um, for read, but not write, obviously, because you have to rebuild the entire index. Um, and there are things like hotspot, hotspotting issues uh, that we have to uh, look at because hotspotting can cause you know, cascading events that can take your entire cluster down. And with uniform, uniform key distribution, it makes everything uh, works really well in HBase. So first attempt. The, we know that the row key represents the behavior. And in the columns, we would store the user ID um, who exhibited that behavior. That much we know. Now, you know, whether we put the timestamp in the row key or the columns, you know, it took us several iterations to figure that out. Um, so if you look at the row key example here, um, the first row key is a composite key. Uh, the, the number in the front, that's our customer ID. The V, B, and Chanel represents the uh, users who view the brand Chanel behavior. And then in the columns, you have the users and the timestamp uh, when the user exhibited that behavior. So that was, that was our first row key uh, design. If you, look at this, if you look at the second example, same thing. Customer ID and the behavior is um, users who clicked on the electronic categories. And of course, there were several issues that we ran into with, with this design. Um, the row got too wide, right? Um, you know, where we keep storing user, we keep pushing users into um, the row, and over time, it just get out of con it gets out of control. Um, and the row can get really wide and large, and it may exceed our, the, the H file size, and that causes a lot of problems in HBase. And that leads to really bad read-write performance. So we tried again, uh, second attempt. So we know that the row size is very large, so how do we get around that? Um, one way to get around that is to uh, partition it and, by date. So we add a timestamp to the end of, e of each row key um, and is a day granularity. What it does is that it reduces the row size and we gain the ability to scan across dates. So we can answer questions like, are users who've performed this behavior you know, between May 1st and May 7th? And it, that is just an H-based scan and it, it runs very quickly. So now we push the, the, the timestamp into the row key, but in the columns, everything else stays the same. And there were still issues, um, but, it was, uh, but it was quite an improvement over the first uh, design. But we still have hotspotting issues because we have very popular products 
or high level categories that can have millions of users each day. So all, the, all of those users will make their way into the HBase columns, again, making the road really wide. And what it does is that it causes one region to serve the same uh, behavior um, for all of the requests. Again, leading to very bad read and write performance. So the hot spotting issue is still there, but not as bad as the first one. All right. And then we arrived at the final design. We built on top of the existing two design. So we have the behavior and the, the timestamp in the row key. The next step is to take that row key and chunk it up into um, and distribute it across um, n number of regions. And that led to significant improvement in read write because now there is n number of regions serving one behavior versus one region, one region serving that behavior. And the way we do that is we prepend a salt to, at the beginning of each row key. So the final key design looks like this. So this is a composite key and in HBase, the key is stored as uh, a byte array. Um, for every component in the key, we prepend a length identifier. Um, and using that schema, we can reconstruct the key very easily. Um, and then if you look at the salt at the very beginning, how do we compute the salt in, in such a way that we can take a key and chunk it up and spread it across the cluster um, for to achieve a uniform key distribution. And it's quite simple. So the, the salt is calculated by taking the behavior and then appending a number between zero and n. n is the number of regions. And for each number, we calculate the salt and prepend that uh, to the key. And then just do a put. And so the final design worked out really well. Um, when we turned it on, it, it made a huge difference in terms of performance. Um, the write was a lot quicker, the read was a lot quicker because everything is distributed evenly, uh, evenly across the cluster. Um, so let's look at a segment. Um, if you look at a complex segment that contains you know, all kinds of behaviors, um, for example, you know, users who have uh, looked at this category today, um, click on something um, yesterday, you know, and you can have a bunch of those in a segment. It's a very complex segment. And you create complex segment to um, reach a certain targeted um, segment. So each behavior in the segment is basically a rule. And each rule is one behavior that we map to a row key in each base. And to calculate the segment, we do a, a get on the row key. And that returns a set of users. And that could be 10 million users. And the, behavior, we, the behaviors are defined in a way that you can use um, ands and or operators to define the behavior. For example, somebody who did something or something and something else. So uh, for every um, row key, we do a get. We get all the users. And then we have to join that users with the next row key that we get back. And so an or is really just a full outer join, and an and is just an inner join. And for small, um, for small rules, we do the join in memory. And for large rules, we join um, on disk. Uh, there's one more uh, thing that I want to touch upon, which is when we write to HBase, the first time we use the, uh, the sync uh, put versus the async um, API, which, is, which was produced by StumbleUpon. And there's a huge difference in terms of uh, between the two, as you can see here. 
you can write much quicker using this async, a async API versus the sync API. So let's look at some of the uh, segmentation uh, numbers. So the latency here, I like to emphasize that again, is in seconds. A user exhibits some behaviors, makes its way, his way into um, HBase, and then um, the customer can ask for the segment with that user within seconds. So there's a very quick turnaround time. Um, and obviously this solution scales really well. If you want better performance, if you want to handle larger user base, just scale out um, your HBase cluster. That's all you need to do. With our setup, um, we can do 40,000 puts. Each put is a behavior um, over only two tables, eight regions um, per second. And again, if you want to scale out, just add more regions. When a customer asks for a segment, um, for some small sub segments, the, re the response time is in milliseconds. So anything that's like in the 50,000 uh, users, uh, you know, milliseconds. M larger segments, like mid-size segments that has like a million users, we can do that in seconds. And then for really large segments, you know, tens of millions, we can do that in tens of seconds. And we are hiring. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, would you approach the microphone, please? Hi, I have a question on your, uh, your de definition of the behavior, right? You're saying each behavior, right. you store users that are in that behavior? Or? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so it's pre whenever you find somebody belongs to behavior, you just it's add to any it. arbitrary behavior that you that you define. You're not just limited to page views or clicks. Those are pretty simple to do, right? This is any complex behavior that you define. You index that with all, all of the users. But you index like individual like behavior, and then you combine them right, into right. a segment. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, with the uh, row key salting that you do, if so that means that a given behavior for a given day can end up in, in regions, right? So you just yes. issue a multi-get for, for all of the regions that? Correct. Okay. And the get is being done in parallel, obviously, right. so it's very quick. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. So I know this wasn't the main topic of your talk here, but one of the things that was interesting to me was, as Murtaza mentioned, there are going to be cases where you're linking online behavior with in-store behavior. Um, given some of your, your clients like Walmart, I can see a lot of difficulty there. Is that more on the client side to figure out how to reconcile behavior in-store versus on-site? You know, I may not have signed in online, so how do you get my information? And same in the store. I think the, the main idea behind is that when we collect all these behaviors online, offline, we have a set of algorithms which, are, which work behind the scenes, which figure out the propensity and the probability with which you as a user, which we identified online, is the same user offline as well. Okay. So if you're, if you're collecting these behaviors across different channels, the algorithm behind the scenes figures out whether you're the same user or not. So is it figuring out whether I'm, I'm exactly me or no. a person like me? A person like you. Okay. A person like Makes you sense. who is, belongs to that segment okay. is what we think. And then in some cases, it's a very clear uh, definition because if the customer or the retailer comes back and says, you know, there is some royalty card or something yeah. which I use and I can identify this user as the same ID, you know, that's a direct correlation. But the other ones are more probability based. In the final design, you mentioned you sharded into fixed regions, and I'm assuming that you had to turn off automatic region splitting, and if so, were there any maintenance problems associated with that? Um, so you don't have to turn automatic region splitting because the number of regions that you shard into, that's a fixed number. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you didn't turn off automatic Regions. We did not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the whole thing is just self-service. There's very little maintenance that needs to go on with uh, this design. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, you mentioned that you support uh, sort of traditional and or rules when you create your segments. Uh, does your architecture, would your architecture support, or do you even have any plans to support more complex segmentation rules? Right, so we're only supporting and and or, and that's really just a limitation of the UI. But the engine itself can compute uh, more complex expressions very easily. One more question. So you talked about, you touched upon um, the uh, membership to, uh, to a segment. How does this happen? So if I'm, a, if I'm a user and I only have few you know, behaviors, how do you calculate my membership to a segment? So right, so there's, was, there's one missing part, which is somebody has to define a segment. What is a segment first, right? And then the engine would grab other users for that segment. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think, I think the other part of it is that depending on what behavior you collect for that, so if there is a segment definition which says a new car segment or a new mom segment or whatever, based on the behavior you exhibit on the site and what those behaviors are, we use all those behaviors to actually compute the segment. Correct. So on, on segmentation, uh, besides the, the Boolean logic, do you use any, any clustering? Yeah, so we have, we have, uh, couple of algorithms behind the scenes which actually are doing the segmentation for, for you. And there is auto segmentation as well, which means that you don't even have to define the segment. We are learning segments behind the scenes through clustering as well. So this happens in real time or this happens? Uh, that also time? happens in real time. Okay. But the, 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 what we showed you is where you define a segment and you evaluate a segment. Okay. But there is another framework which is more performance-based segmentation where we are learning as we get the behaviors, we are learning what segments to define, and the segments are getting defined automatically on the platform. Uh, this, this happens on Hadoop, I believe, the, the, cl the clustering and... That's right. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Okay, sorry. So we are kind of out of time, but um, I, can, I can definitely take your question offline, oh. if you don't mind, sure. because I think we are... Yeah. Thank you.